Welcome back, everyone. We're going to look at King Lear, or Return to King Lear, uh, which we introduced last time. A few uh, thoughts about Act 1, Scene 1, uh, setting the stage for the entirety of the play and really the, uh, the action that takes place there uh, is very much determinative of the rest of the play because the king abdicates his throne, divides his kingdom in three, unprovoked. So it's not like we saw with Macbeth where the king has been murdered by uh, another party. Here he has effectively taken his own life as king. If we talk about the king's two bodies, which I mentioned last time is medieval political theory that holds in the Renaissance as well that the king has a physical body, but also he represents the body politic in his uh, role as king. And so in the latter sense, there is no sense that a kingdom is ever without a king. So when the king dies or the queen dies, the crown passes from one to the next and everyone says the king is dead and then long live the king because the kingship endures and that represents the kingship of Christ over all of uh, the political life of the kingdom as well. Uh, the difference between those two plays is that uh, in the former case, there is a temporary hiatus in the kingship. So there is a, a genuine crisis that there is no king. And that, that uh, breach of rule, lawful rule, has serious consequences. Here it's ser there are serious consequences, but it's not through violence and it's not through an interruption of reign. It happens so quickly that it's a bloodless, I won't say it's a coup, but it's a division of his kingdom in three parts, or at least that was his intention. It ends up dividing in two. Same problem, however. Uh, this is the uh, worst outcome for a kingdom, namely he's divided his kingdom uh, in the manner in which we'd expect from a civil war, which is the worst thing a nation can actually endure. Uh, it, it destroys the, the, the commonwealth, the common good, and it, as I say, it's been done from, from the top down. So it's an, um, an act of madness at the outset. He doesn't appear to be mad. That will come. We will see in Act 3, he degenerates into madness, but that, to some degree, is just playing out the consequences of what happens in Act 1, Scene 1. And, uh, and of course, the, then is uh, the tempest uh, that greets him in Act 3 when he's on the heath and, and dispossessed of all goods and uh, robbed even or naked. Um, all of these are signs of having stripped himself of all of his humanity. So it's, a, it's an exploration in many ways of, a, of the life of the mind in the way that Hamlet was the, the illustrating the life of action. Here we have the life of the mind and the effect of bad decisions. And, and the consequence is the same in both cases. And Shakespeare illustrates it across the board in a myriad of ways. So he'll show it on, on the national level, what happens to the kingdom, it divides in two. But he'll also show it in terms of the king's own household. Remember, the household uh, is one of those spheres that represents the, the monarchy as well. The king and his subjects um, have an analogous relationship to a father and his children. So there's a familial realm here, and that is also suffering an immediate breach. And there's hostility between the sisters, but also between the father and the daughters, even the daughters that he gives everything to, or at least he says that he gives everything to, but he requires them to uh, host him and also to have a retinue that was worthy of a king. So he wants to have his cake and eat it as well and is arbitrary in his decision making. And he's clearly, if he's not mad, he is, um, he's lost his capacities to think rationally. 
And so that's how Act One, Scene One plays out. We see that there are some loyal figures, which is interesting as well. Chief among them is Cordelia, who has the fewest lines in the entire scene, and yet is the most complex in terms of subtext because she doesn't go along with the madness, but doesn't denounce her father either. She's dutiful in that sense. She doesn't publicly humiliate him in her words. On the other hand, she won't go along with um, her sister's uh, compliance with her father's wishes to tell him how much she loves him. And why is that? This is part of the complexity of the whole scene. And if you're going to play Cordelia, what is her motivation for this? Um, how does she feel? How does she act? You're going to have to, if you're acting this, you're going to have to externalize for the audience in some way what Cordelia is feeling uh, inside. And how you do that is going to be difficult, I would have thought. Um, she's going to try and demonstrate a sort of self-possession. Again, this is one of the spheres that we will see is uh, illustrated repeatedly in Shakespeare's plays. I talked about the sphere of, the, of the, the monarchy itself, the sphere of the family. Now you could talk about the sphere of the, the individual person, the sovereignty uh, of, the, of rational thought over the passions. Uh, how is Cordelia managing herself here? We have a picture here of her holding her hands up and shielding herself from her father's wrath and Lear with his hand as if to strike her. I mean, there's such a distance and so forth. And you have the two sisters here, one who's looking up and the other whose face is cast down. Who knows? What we have is the painter trying to depict what he sees in the scene uh, and to illustrate it in certain ways. And you'll have other onlookers here. Uh, all these are doing what, what effectively a dramatist is going to have to do when he stages the play as well. Imagine what the scene looks like and uh, show us what she feels in her heart. And she states that, unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. That's about all you have to go on. Um, so she's signaling there that it is not that she does not love her father. On the contrary, she does love him. And the test of love contradicts her love. So in a sense, she rep represents or embodies in her response a rationality which the others are at odds with. Lear has lost, Lee, he's left his senses entirely. It's a, a, a rash and a mad act. Although his two elder daughters say that he has ever but slenderly known himself. So it's not uncharacteristic, he hasn't become senile and suddenly is acting odd. He's always been prone to rash actions and rash thoughts and doesn't even know his own mind to some degree because he ought to know what, that his youngest daughter will not agree with this contest and will not want to go along with it. And he actually wants to bestow upon her the greatest of the three portions of the kingdom. He expects her to go along with it. Who knows what he's thinking? It's a very strange thing to do, but not as strange as dividing the kingdom up in three anyway. Even if she had gone along with it, the, uh, the bad action would have succeeded because the kingdom would be divided. And again, a kingdom divided is, a, is like a man divided against himself. So she represents, Cordelia represents rationality and true fidelity in the scene. Her sisters profess fidelity by going along with Lear's wishes. Uh, Cordelia appears unfaithful by disagreeing with it, but she's actually the representation of true fidelity in the scene. And by losing everything, we admire her that much more. She's going to be true to herself. She's going to be true to what's reasonal, reasonable, what is right, what is faithful, what is loyal. So she's an extraordinarily persuasive and uh, likable character. 
So when Lear dispossesses her, he not only rejects reason, he dispossesses, dispossesses himself of all the things that would be, uh, that he most wants. He most wants faithful love from his family. And he removes himself from those very things in his first act. Now that's the first act, act one, act one scene one. The second act uh, ensues and we find that uh, the subplot carries forth. Now we've met this fellow Edmund already, Edgar and Edmund, right at the outset of the play. And Edmund is a foil for his brother Edgar. One of them is natural born, is legitimate, namely Edgar. And Edmund is a bastard. That's how he speaks of himself. He's illegitimate. He was not the, uh, it was not the Duchess of, uh, that uh, bore him. It was another woman, and, and she was good sport, says his father. Again, we're given insight into the problems of the men. The older men here are the problem in the kingdom. The, the, there's a corruption that, has, uh, that characterizes the aristocrats here. King Lear himself, we don't have any hints of infidelity on his part, but we have a sense that he's, he's not a very good man. He doesn't rule well. He's not a, a, a man that follows his reason. Whereas the Duke of Gloucester is clearly a little bit of a, well, he's a philanderer and uh, finds that um, even the, the offspring that arise from this are some, something to be sported with. Not a very serious figure. Uh, not very likable figure. So neither of the two old men are likable figures and they are foils for one another as well, are meant to be compared. Likewise, their offspring. So we have Goneril, Regan, and Cordelia that were meant to set aside one, another, one each against the other and to compare and contrast them. And now we'll have Edmund and Edgar and we will, it will raise the whole issue, which is one of the themes of the play, of legitimacy because Lear has committed a lawful act as sovereign to divide his kingdom. But what was legal is plainly irrational and immoral and destroys the very thing that he has legitimacy over. So is it a legitimate act by a king or is it a sort of tyranny that ought to be opposed? And the answer is it is a sort of tyranny that ought to be opposed. And it is opposed by the two most loyal subjects. One of them being Cordelia, although she's not openly opposing it, she just won't go along with it. And the other being Kent, his trusted advisor and friend, his old friend. And for that, he is banished. So this is a bad state. And yet everything has happened legally. What does one do in this situation? Uh, what, how, how does one think of this? I, I noted to you last time that this play, unlike Macbeth, is set against the backdrop of, of pagan thoughts. We don't see references here amongst the characters to Christian uh, themes and motifs and ideas. It seems more pagan. We'll find that it is the case here in Edmund's speech as well. Uh, all the same, it also contradicts what we would call natural law. That's what's being demonstrated here. So the, the appeal will not be to, the, to a Christian articulation of natural law, it's just natural law shorn of Christianity. And that also will be contradicted, violated here in the play. Even though, I, again, it was a lawful act, he was within his rights to do it because he is sovereign, and yet his sovereign act destroyed the very possibility of legitimacy. And so if that's the case, everything that ensues, it's all his fault, and he's getting a sort, he's getting a sort of justice. 
not he's getting injustice, he's getting justice for what he's done. He's the one who contradict the very ground of legitimacy. So in that sense, in that sense, in a very strange sense, Edmund, the bastard, is a lot like Lear. Just if that makes any sense here. So let's look at Edmund's speech, which I think is uh, quite powerful and pr puts Edmund forth as one of Shakespeare's blackest villains. Very dark. Thou nature, with a letter, Edmund, thou nature art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me? For that I am some twelve or fourteen moonshines, lag of a brother. Why, bastard? So, wherefore, base, when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous, and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why brand, why brand they us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base, who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within this dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fops, got tween asleep and wake. Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund, as to the legitimate. Fine word, legitimate. Well, my legitimate, if this letter speed in my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. Now gods stand up for bastards. Okay, the whole language of the opening exchange between Gloucester and his son, when he was speaking to him, he now picks up. It's irked him. It's to say that it's irked him, it's an understatement. He's, he's incensed by the fact that he is being spoken of as, as a bastard. He's humiliated. But he is talking about what one of the things Gloucester said was that his mother was much sport. She was great. Um, it was very exciting, and, and, and that, for that reason, he has a legitimacy about him of sorts, and he's going to acknowledge him. It has to be. And the distinction here is between nature and custom, the plague of custom, and nature, and the multi, multiple ways in which the, the word nature can be understood. In one sense, he has the same nature as Edgar. He has the same human nature uh, in terms of physical endowments and mental capacities and even character. He is just as able. So on that level, he is just as natural as his brother. In fact, maybe his nature is superior. Maybe he's stronger and more intelligent, whatever. So in what sense? Uh, is this a problem? Well, he's going to pronounce nature his goddess because custom stands against him. He speaks like a romantic, quite frankly. The, the law of nations, the customs of the country, will deem him a bastard because he was born 12 to 14 moonshines, lag of a brother. It's just he, it's a matter of time. And note the reference of time is to moonshines, symbol of lunacy as well, and madness. Um, but he's just as much his, his father's son as Edgar is. And his father furthermore praised his mother for the act that brought him about. So in what sense is he inferior to his brother and yet one of them is legitimate and the other is a bastard? wholly illegitimate. This irks him to no end. And so he is against law. He's against 
the law of nature in the sense that I mentioned in the previous scene and to some degree here, namely the moral law. He disputes that nature, that there is a, a, what we call a law of nature or natural law. He has nature, but there's no law to nature. There's no moral dimension to it. So he's dispensing with that as well as custom. So this is an attack on the Tao, if you want to use the phrase that C.S. Lewis uses in The Abolition of Man. And once a, once a villain or a character articulates that he's against all moral considerations, you know what to expect from him. Nothing good. There's no restraint upon him. In a sense, then, he is a lot like Macbeth, who follows his nature, follows his desires, follows his, his greatness, the professions of his greatness, and even the prophecies of his greatness that the witches give, uh, appeals to his nature and his desires and his ambitions, and denies the legitimacy of the Tao. And appeals to nature shorn of those things. Now, this is exactly what happens when we uh, idolize nature, divinize nature. Because if we divinize nature, then every form of nature is equally good, even evil. What we formerly called evil is just as good because it's just as natural and, that, and nature is good. It becomes an overarching indiscriminate category and that's exactly what he's doing here. So Edmund speaks as a proto-romantic who is irked that custom and society has deemed him evil when there is no such thing as evil. It's just a convention and the convention totally delegitimizes de him and so he, to heck with convention. So in, and in that sense, he is doing exactly what Lear did in Act 1, Scene 1. We, except we perceive Edmund to be evil and, and Lear to be just a little bit, you know, he's lost his mind. But it's just as evil in its outcome. And his father enters then. But it's very clear what his intention is here, and it is wholly malign. Now Gloucester's father enters the stage and is dumbfounded by what he's just witnessed in the court. Kent banished thus, and France in collar parted, and the king gone tonight prescribed his power, confined to exhibition, all this done upon the gad? Edmund, how now? What news? He's, he doesn't know what to make of it. All of these things. He's, he's, although he is the king, he's acted as if his power is no longer his, and yet he should play and act as the king. And in a sense, he has the conventional trappings of a king without any of the authority of a king. And all of it just done, as you say, on, the ga on a gad, just the spur of the moment. It's not quite the spur of the moment because the sisters knew it was coming, seemingly. But everything's just disintegrated immediately. So the end of Act, uh, the end of Macbeth, where everything's split apart, uh, here is right at the beginning of King Lear. But he addresses his son. Edmund, how now? What news? So please your lordship none. And he takes the, we have a rare stage directions here, puts up the letter and conspicuously puts it away so that his father sees that he's not only putting it away but trying to hide it from him. Does it in some manner that suggests he's seeking it. Oh. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? Um, I know no news, my lord, 
What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No. What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not so much need to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read. And for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your or looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see, let's see. I hope for my brother's justification. He wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. Essay here in the sense of assay in French to, to try my virtue. Gloucester opens up, reads, This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times. Note that it's, uh, well, you can't even tell on this anyway, but the, the lines run to the end. There's no order. It's a re reflection of a disordered mind and uh, passionate intention, not ruled by reason. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny who sways, not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me, that of this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother, Edgar. Huh? Conspiracy? Sleep till I wake him. You should enjoy half his revenue. My son, Edgar, had he a hand to write this? A heart and brain to breed it in? When came you to this? Who brought it? So, proposal here is to divide up Gloucester's fortune in the very same way that Lear has just done to himself. Who brought it? It was not brought me, Lord, my Lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's. Now Gloucester asks this. Gloucester doesn't even know the character. Or maybe he can't see it well enough, but he doesn't even know his own son's handwriting. Edmund's response, if the matter were good, my, my, my lord, I dare swear it were his, but in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. <laughs> it is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the contents. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that sons at perfect age and fathers declined, the father should be as ward to the son and the son manage his revenue. So exactly what's transpired with Lear and his daughters then. And his view here then as, is that authority should come with capacity, a meritocracy. And of course, Edmund believes in a meritocracy and he thinks that he deserves more because he's better. <coughs> and now it's not, these things are not considered in accordance with nature in terms of fathers and sons and a natural hierarchy, but rather in terms of a meritocracy that is judged in accordance with principles and, uh, and rules that have nothing to do with the natural order of things. I don't like my father. I think I can do a better job than him. I'm more fit and physically able than him, so I should rule and he should be my subject rather than the other way around. Gloucester's response. Oh, villain, villain. His very opinion in the letter. Shows what a fool Gloucester is here. His very opinion in the letter, it's exactly as you've put it here. 
abhorred villain, <clears throat> unnatural, detested, brutish villain, worse than brutish. Go, Sirrah, seek him, I'll apprehend him. Abominable villain, where is he? He immediately jumps to the conclusion that it was he who wrote it without even having investigated and is ready to act upon it. He's just as rash as Lear was. Where is he? I do not know. Well, no, my lord, if it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you should run a certain course. So he urges him to slow down a little bit. Why don't, why don't you investigate this? And the effect of this is actually to make him more eager to execute his judgment. So his, his, the restraint is presented to him externally by Edmund as, ad, as if Edmund were the voice of reason rather than the voice of passion. And he is led by his son in how he should act. against his own best interests here, and certainly that of his son. So why don't you wait till you can drive better testimony of his intent? You should run a certain course, where if, where if you violently proceed against him, may, mistaking his purpose, it would make a great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for him that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honor and to no other pretense of danger. Think you so. Of course, what this does also is it makes Edmund appear a loyal and dutiful son in the same way that Cordelia was a loyal and dutiful daughter. So they are foils for one another as well. Again, this sort of mirroring that Shakespeare does repeatedly in his plays where characters exhibit the opposite uh, action and tendency and intent uh, inclinations of other characters help us to solidify our esteem for the characters. This is a good character, this is an evil character. So it's not just they don't stand on their own, they are exhibited in contrast to those around them. So the light against the dark, etc. And Gloucester, think you so. If your honor judge it meet, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this. And by an auricular assurance, you'll hear it, have your satisfaction. And that without any further delay than this very evening. He cannot be such a monster, nor is not sure. To his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him, heaven and earth, Edmund seek him out. Wind me to, into him. I pray you, frame the business after your own wisdom. I would unstate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. But again, note in Gloucester's speech here, a lack of order and reason. There's, the, there's no meter to his speech. He's speaking like a common man who's lost leave of his senses. He has no, this is not aristocratic speech, although he is an aristocrat. Again, references to nature, but nature now is something that is not governed by morality per se, although he might make reference to this in the speech. These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies. In countries, discord. And palaces, treason. And the bond cracked twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction, there's son against father. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. His offense? Honesty. 
that is strange. Now Edmund, who has just had his father play into his hands like a puppet, he's just played him. So he is a dramaturge figure. Now I want you to think about that again, the, the regular ways in which Shakespeare has characters act as playwrights and has the other characters act in accordance with their wishes. Here we have a anti, an anti-dramaturge figure in the sense that he works evil. Uh, we're not going to look at the play, but Iago does the same thing in uh, Othello. A very wicked and evil uh, character. But Edmund's response, this is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters, the sun, the moon, and stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treacherers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on, and admirable evasions evasion of whore master man to lay his goatish dispositions on the change of a star or the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows. I am rough and lecherous. I, sh I should have been that I am had the maidenliest star in the firmament twinkled on my bastarding Edgar. Bastardizing Edgar. Okay, so what is he saying? The idea of an order in the natural world and some sort of correspondence and that there's an influence here, he disputes all of that. There are no analogies, there are no correspondences, there's no um, consequences to actions in one sphere that will impact another sphere. This is directly contrary to the Elizabethan worldview. Part of what he says is entirely accurate, which is that there is no um, necessity in this, per se, just because a comet falls or that we're out at night in the moonlight doesn't mean that we have to act like we're mad. There's an influence, but not a requirement. We don't live in a deterministic universe. Th that much is true. But that, there, that therefore there is no influence and that there's no legitimacy and there's no sense of order in nature, that does not follow. But that's the conclusion he comes to. So he is an, a, an anarchist and a nihilist to some degree, a very black character. But here he's just simply disputing the fact that uh, the very things that his father referred to as signs of iniquity at work actually are signifying what he claims they are. So Gloucester is, in a sense, speaking a lot like uh, Macbeth was at the outset of the play, that there are certain signs that indicate certain outcomes. So again, Shakespeare is getting us to think about, more generally, the audience, about how natural occurrences have influence but not necessity. They don't necessitate certain outcomes. However, they are signs of something. But we needn't be ruled within it. That's another thing he's going to demonstrate in the play because both Cordelia and Kent will demur and refuse to go along with the uh, unjust edicts of the king. Anyway, Edgar enters. Enter Edgar. Pa! Here he comes. He comes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh like Tom of Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions. Fa sol la mi. Humming the notes. Wonderful singing. <laughs> How now, Brother Edmund? What serious contemplation are you in? 
I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What should follow these eclipses? Goes back to portents and nature. Remember, in Shakespeare's day, they would most certainly, and in the Elizabethan world, Elizabeth very much consulted with her astronomers and where the constellations were and so forth and how she should act in accordance with that. Is that the same thing as consulting astrologers and saying it is so and thus it must be so? And the answer is no, it is not so. But that there's some correspondence here, and this is part of wisdom, is to look to history, to look to nature for how one should act is, for an Elizabethan mindset, a reasonable thing to do. Because there is an order in the world and we can scan it, we can look at it, and we can see something of God's hand in events and then act accordingly. Now again, even if there is an eclipse or there is some unusual astro astronomical event, it doesn't tell you what you're to do. It simply says something very unusual is about to happen and be watchful for it. As I say, the, from, a, from a Christian vantage point, that's exactly what we saw at uh, Christ's birth. The wise men from the East followed the star knew that something unprecedented was about to happen. But so Edmund again refers to this, having just poo-pooed it and said it's nonsense, he will refer to it as if he believed it is true to his brother, who plainly will follow the conventions in this day. And Edgar, to some degree, dismisses it. Do you busy yourself with that? I promise you, the effects he writes of six, of succeed unhappily as of unnaturalness between the child the parent death dearth dissolutions of ancient amities divisions in state menaces and maledictions against king and nobles needless diffidences banishment of friends dissipation of cohorts nuptial breaches and i know not what how long have you been a sectary astro astronomical I never knew you put such stock in planetary motions and their meaning. And Edmund, come, come. So he tries to take his brother down the same garden path that Gloucester had just given into and finds that Edgar's a little bit shrewder than that and doesn't, isn't going to buy it, that that's the cause. Come, come. Um, when saw you my father last? The night gone by. Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms. Found you no displeasure in him by word nor countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him. And at my entreaty, forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of his pleasure, displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him that with the mischief, mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. His father is outraged at me for, for I've, some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. <laughs> I pray you have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage uh, goes slower. And as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my Lord speak. Pray ye go. There's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man if there be any good meaning toward you. I have told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly, nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you away. Shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. Edgar goes out, okay, orchestrating the plot further and manipulating those by lying and misrepresenting the state of Affairs, exit Edgar, and now we get the soliloquy at the end. A credulous father and a brother noble 
whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit. All with me's meat that I can fashion fit. So he's going to appeal to his intelligence. He's the Renaissance man. He's the, remember we're, uh, Shakespeare is writing this play in the midst of the Renaissance and the Renaissance ideal is for a man to have accomplishments in his knowledge, in his actions and so forth. He, he's striving to be superior. He has a model for this in the ancient world that he is seeking to uh, measure up to. And there are yet many men who are rising in the ranks of the Elizabethan court through their uh, superlative intellect and actions. You can actually improve yourself. And he represents such a man. Now, nothing wrong with that per se, but how does that excellence regard itself in relation to inherited excellence, the order of things as they already exist? Is the one order a threat to the other order? Scene three. So the, the subplot has been hatched, and we will see that it, the intention of it is clearly to uh, divide up and act against Gloucester in the same way Lear acted against himself. But it'll be the same outcome. Scene three, enter Goneril and Stuart Oswald, who's also a rather villainous character. Goneril, did my father strike my gentleman for chitting of his fool? I, madam, by day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. Horns within. King's been out on a hunt and he's got a big riotous party and they're all blowing their trumpets and having a great old time. He's coming, madam, I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. She wants to provoke her father into a conflict. If he distaste it, let him to my sister, whose mind and mine I know in that are one. Not to be overruled, idle old man, that he hath given, uh, that, that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Now, by my life, old fools are babes again and must be used with checks as flatteries when they are seen abused. Remember what I've said. Well, madam, and let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it? No matter. Advise you your fellows so. I would breed from hence occasions, and I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. And out they go. Now, Kent comes in and somehow disguises himself in such a way that Lear does not recognize him. Now, I don't know how that is possible, but he enters disguised. Now, in this sense, he's a, again a lot like in Measure for Measure, the Duke comes in disguises himself and is going to try and be a dramaturg figure himself behind the scenes. Will he be effective in his attempt to orchestrate affairs? Well, we know the answer is no, but he's going to, to attempt this and not leave the kingdom as he was uh, commanded to do and warned to do. Enter king disguised as keys how we pronounce it here, not Caius. 
If but as well I other accents borrow, that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I have raised my likeness. So he's clean shaven now, he got rid of the beard. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned, so may it come thy master, whom thou lovest, shall find thee full of labors. Horns within enter Lear, knights and attendants from hunting Lear. Let me not stay a jot for dinner. Go get it ready. <coughs> um, how now? What art thou? A man, sir. What dost thou profess? What wouldst thou with us? Because he stands in front of them and is clearly wanting his attention. I do profess to be no less than I seem. To serve him truly, that will put me in trust. To love him, that is honest. To converse with him, that is wise and says little. To fear judgment. To fight when I cannot choose and to eat no fish. Um, the eating of no fish may be a reference to a Catholic. Good, on, on Fridays, we eat fish for fasting. You're not eating meat. Fish is not considered meat. You eat fish on a Friday. Or it could have um, uh, connotations of philandering with women and so forth. So it's a little double. Not exactly. Elizabethan slang here. And it says this in my, in my footnote as well, to eat no fish, to be a Protestant, question mark, or, or to be a hearty fellow, a meat eater. Yes, but I think, the, I think there's other connotations here as well. Anyway, uh, what art thou? A very honest hearted fellow and as poor as the king. Aha, as poor as the king. If thou beest as poor for a subject as he's for a king, thou art poor enough. What wouldst thou? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? You. Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir. But you have that in your countenance which I would fain call master. What's that? Authority. King likes the flattery. What services canst thou do? I can keep honest counsel, ride, run, mar a curious tale in telling it. Be funny. And deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified in. And the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing nor so old to dote on her for anything. I have years on my back, 48. Follow me. Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will not part from thee yet. Dinner, ho, dinner, where's my knave, my fool? Go you and call my fool hither. The attendant goes out, Oswald comes in. You, you, sirrah, where's my daughter? So please you. And he just <laughs> rudely leaves away, uh, exit the scene. What says the fellow there? Call that clot, clot pole back, exit a knight. Where's my fool? Ho, I think the world's asleep. Knight comes in. How now, where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came not the slave back to me when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. He would not. My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well in the general dependence as in the duke himself also and your daughter. Ha! Sayest thou so? I beseech you pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken, for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wrong. 
Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late, which I have rather blamed as mine own jealous unkindness. I will look further into it. But where is my fool? I have not seen him this two days. Since my young lady's go going into France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I have noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Go you, call hither my fool. Now Oswald comes back in. Oh, you, sir, you come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father? My lady's father? My lord's knave. You horse and dog, you slave, you cur. I am none of these, my lord, I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? I'll not be strucken, my lord. And then Kent comes in, nor trip neither, you base football player, tripping him up by his heels. <laughs> I thank you, fellow. Thou serves me, and I'll love thee. Come, sir, arise away. I'll teach you differences. Away, away. If you will measure your lubber's length again, tarry. But away, go to, have your wisdom. So, and he pushes out Oswald. Now, my friendly knave, I thank thee. There's earnest of my service and gives him a little bit of money. Now the fool comes in and the great character of the fool, the famous character of the fool enters. And the fool, uh, fools in the, uh, we'll conclude with this uh, thought on fools before coming back. Uh, fools serve in the courts as a reminder to kids, their entertainment, first of all. But they also are to some degree there to remind kings of their mortality because they have the power of, of a sovereign. They can execute their judgments in accordance with their will without any measure. And they're there to some degree to remind them that they're just a man. In that sense, although they are fools, they are figures of wisdom and restraint. And that the way they go about it is not the way that Kent as the counselor would have done it, which is through basically open declarations and counsel, but through, through jesting. Uh, just a, it's another way of trying to get the same outcome. And comedy works this way. Comedy can be very serious, can be just entertainment, but for Shakespeare, comedy would be uh, allied with tragedy in teaching us about the nature of things, and the fool will act in accordance with that. So the fool is a figure of wisdom who is very much put out by the departure of Cordelia into France, line 74. He's much pined away because he sees the implications of it. It's not just that he misses Cordelia, he sees that it as an ominous sign that the most beloved subject, the most beloved daughter is now no longer there. How should he act? Because if reason has abandoned, how about wisdom? Is there any place for a fool uh, and his wisdom in the presence of this foolish king? And he's going to then, uh, his speeches are going to be poking at exactly that point. Which one of us is the fool here? Fools can get away with saying things that uh, advisors normally cannot do so. It's expected that they always be jesting. But there's a lot of earnestness and seriousness to the, fo to the fool's jesting here. But I'll, pick it, I'll leave it off here and we'll come uh, after the break.